So I welcome you to this special uh, event at the college, which will be really a series of short presentations, but a very open and frank discussion among some of our leading academics here at the National Security College on, uh, you guessed it, the, the aftermath, the fallout of the US presidential election last week. Uh, we, talk, we want to talk in particular about what we would call lessons from the campaign, but also lessons really internationally, lessons for countries like Australia, uh, uh, an ally of the United States with obviously very deep security interests tied in with the decisions and direction of the United States, lessons for smaller and medium powers around the world, lessons for democracies uh, in understanding a lot of the currents, a lot of the tensions uh, ha happening at, at home and abroad, uh, but really I would say lessons for any country interested in the future uh, in quite an unpredictable uh, international security environment. So I'll offer a few remarks of my own before I introduce our speakers and invite them to offer some opening remarks, but we want to focus this very much on a discussion today, uh, so there'll be some moderated discussion uh, among the members of our panel, uh, an opportunity for you as well to ask questions or offer comments uh, from the floor. Just a reminder to switch off your mobile phones or put them on silent um, so that we can uh, keep the, I guess, the, the harmony of our proceedings. Uh, feel free to tweet, of course. Um, this is part of a much wider, wider conversation. Um, our other three speakers today, I'll just uh, mention briefly at this point, uh, Associate Professor Matthew Sussex, who's the director of our academic program here at the college. Associate Professor Michael Clark, uh, the graduate convener of our uh, academic program. And of course, Dr. Adam Henschke, uh, who's a lecturer in national security here at the college. I should also note that Dr. Jennifer Hunt, um, another of our lectures, lecturers in national security, was to be with us today, uh, but she got a better gig. She's gone to Sydney to be on Q&A um, for ABC TV tonight. Um, so um, that can go a little way to explaining the, uh, the lack of gender balance in our panel here today. Um, but please watch for Dr uh, Jen Hunt's uh, commentary tonight on Q&A um, because I think that's part of a much wider contribution we want to make to uh, a really diverse national conversation on these issues. So a few of my own views, I guess, to, to begin. Um, I wrote last week in the Financial Review, and I think I stand by that judgment, that the, the Trump presidency is what we might call a black elephant. Now, if you haven't heard that term before, uh, you heard it here first. Um, but a black elephant is, is what you get when you combine what's known in the strategic analysis literature as a black swan. That is a, uh, a great surprise, a really fundamental strategic surprise, something that you completely did not expect, with the elephant in the room. In other words, the big problem that's staring you in the face that you don't want to admit to or talk about that's so big, so obvious, uh, so problematic that you refuse to prepare for it. Uh, so in a sense, I think what we're facing with the Trump presidency uh, from an Australian national interest point of view is indeed uh, a black elephant. Uh, it's a, an outcome that will, I think, have a very serious impact on our security environment, our strategic environment, and the choices that we make as a country. Uh, it's a reality check, I guess, for a country like Australia that is invested and that does invest so much in the alliance with the United States. Uh, now, I wouldn't go so far as to say that this is the end of the alliance or even the beginning of the end of the alliance. There's been some quite uh, dramatic commentary in the media to that effect. I do think that uh, there's an opportunity here for Australia to play the role of a much more active, uh, active ally uh, in trying to shape the future direction of the alliance towards our interests. But there is also, I think, room now and an important opportunity now, in, indeed uh, an inevitable challenge now for Australia to hedge, as they say, in maybe a different way uh, than we've understood in the past. Hedging is a term that's often used in the international relations <coughs> literature to think about a country preparing for multiple difficult possibilities in its future and maybe defining its choices. So it's often said that we're hedging against, uh, for example, Chinese power uh, in the Indo-Pacific, and I think we are. But now we're hedging also against American unpredictability, and that makes the challenge for Australia even more difficult. Now, one or two uh, other opening thoughts from me. I would first say that we have to begin this conversation, uh, I think, from an Australian perspective in thinking about Australia's 
national interests. In the end, we can have our views, uh, as many of us I'm sure individually do, about uh, the political choices uh, and indeed the rhetoric in the US election campaign, uh, much of which many reasonable people would find pretty objectionable. But uh, as professional security analysts uh, here at the National Security College, for example, we also have to think about what this means for Australia's national interests and make that really the foremost consideration in how we respond uh, to the US election. Uh, and in that sense, um, there are three lessons that I would suggest um, bringing out of uh, what we've seen last week in the United States. Firstly, I'd start by pointing out, before I get to those lessons, that we have to think about Australia's national interests in a pretty broad way. Uh, and as I think uh, colleagues here at the college often remind our students, Australia uh, defines its national security very broadly. It's not just about the, uh, the preservation of our territory or indeed of our sovereignty uh, or indeed the welfare and safety of our citizens, but it's also about such issues as uh, a rules-based international order, which for a country, for a middle power, a country of Australia's size and capabilities is really uh, deeply in our interest. We are not a country uh, that really has its way in the world through coercion or through force. We rely on the rules and on a rules-based system. Australia also has an interest in uh, really its credibility as a middle power in the world. But in particular, Australia has an interest in ensuring the reliable, predictable functioning of the international system and what we would call our lifelines of connectivity with the world, whether it's in maritime security, cyber security, flows of people, of information, of commerce, uh, and so forth. So that, makes, that really makes the job of Australian governments in preserving and advancing Australia's interests exceptionally <coughs> challenging and difficult. Basically, Australia's interests are simply too large for a country of Australia's resources and capabilities to protect and advance alone. And that's why partnerships, including the US alliance, are so important. So in that context, the three lessons that I would uh, suggest that we might take home from what has happened in the United States last week. I think the first lesson, and these are about politics, sovereignty and the alliance uh, in that order. I think the first lesson, which is about politics, so I'm straying here, I guess, from my national security brief, uh, but it's striking that so many of the challenges that seem to be facing Australia, whether they're security, whether they're economic, whether they're at the level of society or indeed the, uh, the natural environment, can only be addressed through really quite a radical revival of moderation uh, in our own political debate, a revival of uh, the politics of moderation, of compromise, and negotiation, uh, a quest for common ground along with an acceptance of difference. And that's why I think what we've seen in the United States, the real crushing, if you like, of the moderate centre uh, in the past week, I think has been such a troubling, such a really frightening message for our politics. And I think the answer, of course, is not to emulate that. It's to uh, really look to, I think, the qualities of Australia's democracy of, um, of Australia's multicultural society to find uh, an alternative way to confront major problems in the world. The second um, lesson that I would take is really, about, uh, is, is really about sovereignty. And I think the thing that's really disturbed me uh, and certainly some of our analysts looking at what's happened in the United States this year is the role that um, very credibly reported interference from a foreign power and from entities outside of the US political system have played in this election. Now, I'm not saying the result would necessarily have been different if we hadn't seen uh, the really, uh, you know, really large-scale cyber intrusion and media manipulation uh, that's been linked with, uh, with Russia, that's been linked with entities like WikiLeaks and so forth. But we have seen a new role for um, really the mass manipulation of social media uh, and the use of cyber intrusion, indeed of espionage, to affect the democratic process in the world's largest democracy. And I think in that post-truth environment that we're seeing, this atomised post-truth environment, we're seeing the effect of a new form of new forms of propaganda directed from overseas. And I think that's deeply troubling for any democracy, including a democracy like uh, Australia. Um, I think we've seen democracy disrupted and defamed through this process, and that's uh, really going to be a challenge for our institutions. It's interesting that the security establishments in democratic countries, including this one, I'm not sure have a very clear idea of how to respond to, to this new kind of politics, to this new kind of foreign interference, even to determine particularly whose responsibility it is to identify, detect or respond 
for that kind of interference. And finally, the third and I think the sharpest lesson for Australia is about our international security strategy and about our dependence on, our critical dependence on the alliance with the United States. Now, as I've said, unless Australia would have vastly change the way it addresses security issues and the resources that it devotes to them, uh, we are not going to have a defence and security strategy without a significant role for the alliance with the United States. Um, in that sense, my own view is that despite uh, what we've read about the impact of the Trump win and despite the obvious unpredictability uh, that we need to come to terms with here, um, I do think the alliance will weather the next four years, but it will have to endure some pretty significant uh, blows, some pretty significant harm. Um, because I think it's clear that the Trump administration will demand more of allies than previous presidents, will deliver less in return to those allies, will have a tendency to take allies for granted, uh, which of course isn't the first time this may have happened uh, in history, but may be more accentuated than in the past. And I think we'll struggle to understand precisely what kind of country Australia actually is, the, the change and the complexity of this country uh, that's occurring. And even beyond that, uh, we can assume that even if the, the more positive interpretations of the way the Trump administration will develop uh, become true, in other words, even if uh, good advice begins to become uh, accepted in the system, even if uh, a reasonable body of moderate, respected, experienced international advisers come to the fore in a Trump or Trump-Pence administration. Nonetheless, uh, we can assume that Washington from here on is going to, to pick its fights in the world with great care and it will not assume that it has wide popular support when it goes forth to take risks to defend the international rules-based order on which, as I've noted, Australia depends. So my final conclusion from that for the time being, I guess, is that a country with Australia's finite security capabilities and very special democratic qualities is going to have to do much more for itself in the world. So we need to think much harder, I think, about what uh, an integrated <coughs> national security strategy for Australia would look like, how we do more to really join up the various arms of government, the various capabilities very substantial capabilities we have in this country, including in the private sector, including in the wider community, and including at a state and territory level, to really achieve a more integrated national response uh, to protect our lifelines with the world and to d deter coercion when it exists. I guess my point is, it, is that if Australians take their security seriously, um, what we've just seen should be a reality check or a wake-up call that national security is going to become everyone's problem and not just something for uh, Canberra's hard-working security cast. So I would say that we need to reimagine what the US alliance is and to embed that into a resilient network of partners in our region, in the Indo-Pacific. Regional countries will have to do more to help one another and to help themselves to cope, for example, with China's growing power and with that American unpredictability I've mentioned. Um, and I can give you a list of those countries and we can talk about that a little bit more in the discussion. But I certainly would conclude by saying that um, Australia's long holiday from needing its own grand strategy um, is certainly over. Um, on that cheery note, I'm going to invite um, my colleague uh, Matt Sussex to offer you some remarks, please. Thanks, Rory. Uh, Rory was uh, somewhat downbeat towards the end. I'm going to see if I can uh, trump him, so to speak. Um, oh, that's going to get very old very, very quickly. Um, I'm going to base my remarks uh, on the understanding that when we look at national security policy, uh, going back to first principles, uh, it demands, first of all, caution and pragmatism. And I think the result in the United States shows us that we need to do that more so now uh, than before. In a sense, I'll be framing my remarks about a reshaping of Australia's position uh, in terms of its interests rather than necessarily its values. It struck me as interesting that uh, you've seen a fair bit of commentary, obviously, on uh, what a security order under Trump might look like. And already you see some trends and themes starting to emerge that say, well, it's not going to be that bad. You know, Trump will face uh, a whole bunch of pressures as president that he didn't experience as a candidate 
as a candidate. He was free to say virtually anything he wanted. The realities of office will dictate a measured and moderate response. And in terms of some commentary I've read, that uh, says, functionally, it will be no different to uh, an Obama-led security policy, uh, although it may differ in terms of rhetoric. I think this is fundamentally wrong. Uh, and let me tell you why. I'll give you some domestic reasons, primarily. Uh, one is that Trump will be the most powerful US president for a very, very long time. He not only controls the White House, his party controls both houses. In other words, he has mandate and he has means, the two things that any political actor seeks as their ultimate expression of political power. The second domestic reason I would uh, give you is more related to Trump's own personality. Uh, and that is, he will be utterly convinced of his own correctness now. <laughs> utterly. He has proven all the doubters wrong, many of whom came from within his own party. He will therefore be convinced that his own view is correct and that he has the answer and the solution to pretty much every problem that might confront America uh, or the rest of the world. This bodes poorly for the makeup of his administration, as we've seen. Uh, there are a variety of people emerging from the woodwork who would serve in a Trump cabinet. The problem is that a large number of those who do have experience, who do have a great deal of past knowledge about how to make uh, uh, recommendations to the president on matters of national security policy, have said that they will not work under a Trump administration. This creates a vacuum. It also creates a vacuum that is a vacuum of talent that is exacerbated by Trump's own persona and it raises the spectre that those who do go to work in a Trump administration will be those who are appointed on the basis of whether or not they agree with Trump and on the basis of how much they are prepared to agree with Trump as opposed to providing objective advice and opinions. It is also the case, I think, that like any populist, and to an extent Obama was a populist too and faced a similar challenge, any populist creates high expectations for change amongst the population. Trump will feel that he will have to try, at least try and put in place at least half of the domestic and foreign agenda that he has set himself, otherwise he is not being true to those who elected him in the first place. For those reasons, then, I think we are going to experience a number of international impacts, and here's where I get kind of heretical and gloomy. Number one, uh, it is the end of the rules-based order. This will have a number of normative, international legal and geopolitical impacts. What are the casualties? Number one casualty will be the deal with Iran. That has more than just local significance. Tearing up the nuclear deal with Iran will open up the space for Russia. It will open up the, the space for China. It will also open up trade routes that are preferenced by those two nations. In other words, ending the deal with Iran brings about one belt, one road, quite convincingly. It is the end, I think, of any conjecture over who may win in Syria. Assad wins, effectively. We can expect Trump to do a deal with Putin uh, that uh, results in an Assad-led uh, Syria moving forward, uh, that uh, those who may be moderate or a loose amalgam of moderates, those who are seeking to combat the Assad regime for various uh, reasons, will likely lose. And in terms of normative impacts, uh, I think it's the end of the R2P. The R2P was sick before Trump won. It was particularly sick because a number of nations, particularly Russia, particularly China, had sought adaptationalist approaches to interpreting the R2P and had said various things like, well, we have a responsibility to protect our own citizens. If you're Chinese, that means a responsibility to protect the vast bulk of our citizenry against splitism, against terrorism, against separatism. The Russians used it as, an in, as a normative justification for power maximization and increasing real estate, that the Russians had an obligation to protect ethnic Russians who were living in the Baltic states, in Ukraine, in uh, uh, South Ossetia and other places. Number two big impact is the reshaping of the transatlantic partnership. 
Uh, and I focus again on Russia because it will be particularly emboldened and has been particularly emboldened by the Trump victory. If you look at the various things Trump has said, and he hasn't said all that much, but um, what he said since being elected, the one consistent message has been the potential for a partnership with Russia. That has been the one thing that he has demonstrated he's not flagging any compromise on. Compromising on Americans getting together, healing rifts, possibly even on trade, all sorts of areas, but not Russia. If you are in the Baltic states right now, you'll be very, very worried about this, obviously. If you're Estonia and you've had your airspace violated 462 times this year by Russian military overflights, and you've been subjected to enormous cyber attacks, you'd be particularly worried. You'd be even more worried if you're in Brussels, of course, because on one thing, Trump is right, and that is that NATO and Europe has free ridden on the United States since the end of the Cold War. It has spent nowhere near most of those countries, 2% on defence. It will become necessary for European nations to spend a lot more on their defence and security policy than they have in the past. The final implication in terms of the transatlantic partnership, but it has a broader global reach, uh, relates to cyber. We can expect increased Russian-led hacking, trolling, attempts to influence, influence the political process in places like France, the next potential domino where Marine Le Pen uh, continues to poll strongly. You can see increased, you can expect to see increased uh, um, misinformation campaigns uh, directed at the enemies of Trump inside America. And those more broadly who adhere to what many in Russia and China would see as the old liberal order that has had its time. That means in Australia as well. Third major impact relates to the strategic map of the Asia Pacific. And I think what we're going to see from the Trump administration is effectively offshore balancing with trade war with China. In other words, the peace through strength agenda that he's articulated. That's going to prompt a, bu prompt a bunch of choices for Australia's trading agenda, but also fundamentally its security partnerships. And I'd echo what Rory said about the need for Australia to reach out pragmatically on issues that it can cooperate with other nations, such as Japan on defence material, defence tech, the Republic of Korea, Singapore, Indonesia, there are many, many others. Let me end then with an observation from international relations, uh, international relations theory, which is where I come from as an academic. Uh, it's about the end of the Cold War. After the Cold War ended, a bunch of academics came out and said, we're probably going to witness a multipolar world order. That's probably it for NATO. It doesn't really have a purpose. It doesn't really have a need to exist. We are likely to see traditional security alliances become much more comp complex, if not fragment. We're going to see a more uncertain and unstable world order. We may see the increased risk of nuclear proliferation. Multipolar world orders tend to be more unstable. They tend to result in more and more small, wor small wars. I don't like to say, we told you so, that would be churlish, so let me said, say this instead. We told you so. <laughs> Individuals like Trump, uh, the role of agency, will say, well, hang on, Trump as an individual managed to sweep away uh, the political centre, as Rory said. So it's all down to individuals. I think, generally speaking, the empirical record shows that individuals affect the timing of changes in international politics, but they don't necessarily affect its ultimate outcome. However, there is a small silver lining, and I think that is that the shift back towards some form of multipolar world order in which Australia will occupy a key role in a very uncertain security environment that will be nonetheless the geopolitical centre of gravity for globalisation, is that multipolar systems are an order that we know, that we understand. We know them because they facilitate multi-vector foreign policies. They can be quite good for middle powers who are prepared to act pragmatically. And I think that's the key lesson that I'd like to, uh, to leave with you, that Australian foreign and security policy must adopt a posture that is broad, must adopt a posture that is prepared to compromise more than in the past, and must enable fundamentally choice rather than foreign and security policies that constrain those choices. Because under the type of system, if even half of what Trump says comes to pass, the type of system that exists, any country that adopts uh, a foreign security policy that constrains its choices uh, is going to do very poorly indeed. Thank you very much, folks.
thank you, thank you, Matt. I don't know if I mean to thank you because um, there's some pretty gloomy prognostications there and I'll be very interested for us to have this conversation again in a couple of years and I certainly hope you won't be saying I told you so <laughs> then, um, but I do think there's some, um, some really bold and, and sobering assessments there, so look, thanks for um, opening our minds on that. And I'll now invite um, Associate Professor Michael Clark, um, Graduate Convener of the National Security College who also teaches uh, American politics here at the college to give his view, please. Uh, thanks, thanks, Rory. Um, and I've gone one better than Matt. I, I picked up some merchandise uh, in Washington on my way home uh, to get on board late on the Trump bandwagon. Um, okay, so I suppose I'll address my remarks to two sort of core questions that I think we're all talking about today. Uh, firstly, how do we begin to make sense of Trump's victory? And secondly, uh, how can we speculate, speculate on the future trajectory of his administration's uh, foreign policy? Uh, so, with respect to, to these sort of two core questions, there have been a number of uh, elements of commentary uh, in the media of late, uh, suggesting a number of different answers. One is to see uh, Trump's rise as a, as, a as, as a resurgence of authoritarianism and perhaps even fascism uh, in the United States. Uh, another is to see it simply as the product of white working class anger and resentment against the neoliberal post-Cold War consensus in the United States. In a foreign policy setting, some suggest that Trump's victory represents a return to isolationism uh, or even a return to uh, one individual suggested a Nixon-Kissinger realism, uh, which I think is particularly far-fetched. Uh, however, my particular approach here is to take us back in time and history. Uh, in particular, I suggest that Trump in many respects represents a resurgence uh, of what Walter Russell Mead defined as the Jacksonian tradition in American politics and foreign policy. And secondly, uh, as, a, as a, a second element of this argument, is that the return to Jacksonian sentiment in the United States is symptomatic about a critical doubt in the US public about the viability of the United States continuing to underwrite uh, an international liberal world order. So Jacksonian sentiment, what is it? Um, I'd like to sort of preface uh, this, this section of my remarks by a quote from Thomas Jefferson speaking about Andrew Jackson himself in 1824. He said, I feel much alarmed at the prospect of seeing General Jackson president. He's one of the most unfit men I know of for such a place. He has had very little respect for laws and constitutions. His passions are terrible. When I was president of the Senate, he was senator, and he could never speak on account of the rashness of his feelings. I've seen him attempt it repeatedly and has often choked with rage. He is a dangerous man. <laughs> so, what is the Jacksonian tradition? Uh, Mead suggests a number of elements to this, to, to, to this tradition uh, and largely focused on uh, President Jackson himself uh, and his leverage of anti-elitist sentiment in the United States in the, in the 1820s with the beginning of uh, universal male suffrage in a number of states, a focus on uh, protection of states' rights, protection of individual liberty, broadly populist in approach. Mead, I think, crucially suggests that Jacksonianism is a community of political feeling focused on Scotch-Irish ancestry, Protestantism and individual liberty. The central engine of this tradition, Mead suggests, is a belief that government should do everything in its power to promote the well-being, political, economic and moral of the folk community. Any means are permissible in the services of this end, as long as they do not violate the moral feelings or infringe on the freedoms that Jacksonians believe are essential. So, in a foreign policy setting, the call to arms here of the Jacksonian tradition uh, is not the moral underpinnings, for, for instance, of Wilsonian internationalism, but rather the protection of the folk community from threat, uh, be it defined as political, economic or cultural threat. In domestic context, Trump, as we have seen, has appealed directly to this folk community that feels imperiled by demographic change, economic dislocation and a disconnection from elite inside the beltway positions on a range of issues. Uh, from global trade to foreign policy. More specifically, uh, there are a number of, of central elements to the Jacksonian tradition of foreign policy that are important to touch upon here. The first one it relates to the central engine, the protection of the folk community. Uh, and this determines in many respects historically the threshold for action. For example, if we think of uh, Jacksonian opinion and American public opinion uh, that FDR had to navigate in the lead up to the Second World War, it was only with a direct attack uh, upon the United States at Pearl Harbor, that he was able to mobilise enough public opinion uh, to make the step 
to war. Similarly, in the first Gulf War, uh, the first Bush administration struggled to get Jacksonian opinion on board until it construed Saddam Hussein's invasion of, a, of Kuwait as an economic threat to the security of uh, Jacksonian America. The second core element of the Jacksonian tradition is its focus on the protection of national honour and reputation. Here, Mead suggests, suggests that Jacksonian opinion is sympathetic to the idea that our reputation, whether for fair, fair dealing, cheating, toughness or weakness, will shape the way others treat us. And I think this sentiment has been particularly prevalent in some of Trump's statements on a range of issues, uh, from alliance relationships to trade. Finally, in the absence of threat, uh, direct threat upon the Jacksonian community, Jacksonian opinion can tend towards disengagement and even isolationism. So what does this mean uh, for looking ahead to what a President Trump uh, foreign policy will look like? Uh, we've seen a number of signals already. The first is Trump's overt questioning of the web of US alliance systems throughout the world, NATO, US-Japan alliance, US alliance with South Korea and perhaps even uh, the US alliance with Australia. Key aspects here include the Jacksonian focus on honour and reputation. Uh, for example, Trump had stated numerous times on the campaign trail uh, at his rallies that we won't be ripped off anymore in paying for others' security or we won't be taken advantage of. A second issue to note is Trump's position on ISIS, uh, which is, I think is quite interesting in the Jacksonian lens. In particular, Trump has construed ISIS as a direct threat to the security of the Jacksonian folk community to which he is appealing. And therefore, this justifies any form of action necessary. Hence, his statements about, and I quote, bombing the shit out of ISIS and taking their oil. Thirdly, uh, and perhaps centrally to what we're talking about directly uh, relating to Australia's national security, is Trump's strident opposition to the post-Cold War neoliberal economic order, uh, in particular through his response to uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, and his ideas about uh, uh, developing a trade war uh, with China. Uh, which he claims uh, has economically raped the United States. All of this has troubling implications, uh, particularly for our region. Uh, the first issue would be increased doubt amongst US allies uh, regarding the staying power and political will of the United States to stay engaged in Asia. The second core issue, I think, which is increasingly important, we think about, and Matt's touched upon this, on, on Russian adventurism and also Chinese assertiveness in the South China Sea, is what will be the US threshold for action, particularly military action, uh, under a largely Jacksonian uh, president? Uh, will Trump respond to Chinese uh, assertiveness in the South China Sea? Thirdly, uh, relates to the questioning of the liberal economic order. Does this imperil regional security? Uh, does it embolden China? Uh, does it threaten, in fact, to result in bad bandwagoning with China rather than balancing against China? which is arguably what we've seen over the past decade. And here it's important to think of China's own multilateral regional initiatives, uh, One Belt, One Road, that matters also already touched upon, and also the Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank. Finally, and again matters also touched upon this, is the Jacksonian tendency to withdraw, to disengage. Does this threaten to accelerate uh, a shift to a truly multipolar international order, particularly in Asia? So, to conclude, Trump, I would suggest, is not exceptional in terms of American history. He's very much within a historical tradition. The core issue uh, for many US allies, particularly Australia, is that his views on foreign policy and the sentiment that he's tapping into directly challenges a number of core assumptions uh, about the post-1945 international system uh, that the United States leadership has, has, has underpinned for, for many decades. So the trouble for Australia vis-a-vis -vis a Trump presidency is really threefold. It's strategic in the sense of a shift to a unipolar, to a multipolar order, and what will that mean uh, for Australia's alliance relationship with the United States, but also relationships with other regional partners. There's also a political challenge here uh, related to the decline of a liberal or rules-based international order. And finally, there's also the economic challenge. Does US disengagement from multilateral uh, trade agreements uh, and drawing back from uh, a commitment to a liberal, open international trading system, uh, will this fundamentally imperil Australia's own national security, given our reliance on, on, that tr on, on international trade and that open system moving forward? Um, so I'll conclude there. Thank you.
Michael, uh, thank you very much, including for reminding us uh, that the study of history is so, so important. Um, Adam Henschke, I'll now invite to speak. Uh, Dr Henschke, among other things, is our resident uh, ethics expert at the National Security College, which makes the conversation he's going to have about the Trump presidency extra piquant, I think, so please. Thank you, Rory. Um, someone did ask me earlier today, well, what's the ethics of the Trump presidency? And my brain just went blank. I couldn't actually think of anything whatsoever to say, which is quite uncommon for me. Um, I would also like to point out that I'm not Jennifer. Um, Jennifer Hunt, uh, I'd like to remind you that she's going to be on Q&A tonight. So um, she will have probably some very interesting things to say there. So please uh, keep an eye out for her. Um, as Rory, Rory mentioned, I work primarily in ethics and philosophy as that relates to national security. Um, I don't really have a great deal of expertise in relation to international relations or American domestic policy, foreign policy, etc. But those of you who saw me uh, give a bit of a talk about Brexit when that happened, uh, when was that, about six months ago, um, the caveat that I put there was I'm not an expert on anything to do with uh, Britain, but it seemed that all the experts got it wrong anyway. Um, <laughs> and I'd like to make the same claim here. You know, it seems so absolutely unpredictable and unlikely that Trump was going to win and you know, it was all about how much is Hillary going to win? Is she going to get the House? Is she going to get this, that or whatever? So in this sense, you know, I make the caveat that I don't know anything, but it seems the people who claim to know a whole lot of stuff, they don't know anything either. Um, so one of the thing that I want to focus on is what does this campaign mean? So trying to draw some lessons out of the campaign itself, maybe a little bit less about what the Trump presidency means, um, but I think the campaign, looking at some of the campaign aspects and elements uh, could be quite interesting. And so the three things that, gonna, that I'm going to talk about uh, quickly, I guess, are the role of information in the campaign, divisions in the US and national security norms. Um, in terms of information, as we all know, the polls were wrong. The polls were profoundly wrong, and a lot of the meta polls as well, for want of a better phrase, were wrong. So in the previous um, US elections, Nate Silver's website, 538, um, which did all this kind of analysis of polls, meta polling, all this sort of stuff, that had predicted things very, very nicely and very accurately and often, you know, weeks in advance. Three weeks before um, the election, uh, 538 had Clinton at an 85% chance of winning. Um, so I think, you know, with what seemed to be the most, some of the most reliable um, analysis of the polls um, being absolutely wrong, we have a really interesting set of outcomes here. Um, in this sense, you know, we can agree with what uh, maybe some of the pro-Trump people were saying or have been saying that the elites were wrong. But here we've got to include the elites being not just the Democrats and the Democrat <coughs> supporters and the Clinton supporters, but a lot of the Republicans as well. A lot of the Republican elite, Republican establishment, they were wrong again three weeks ago. They were moving away from Trump, you know, at an ever-increasing pace. Um, also, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in a moment, but national security leaders seem to get it wrong. Um, obviously, the media uh, got it wrong, and most importantly, celebrities got it wrong. <laughs> and if we can't take our guidance from celebrities, then I don't know what's happening in the world. Um, but again, this, this shouldn't come as a major shock when we look back on this and you know, have our hindsight 2020 um, as accurate as possible. We saw this in Brexit. So again, we had a whole bunch of elites, you know, an establishment that was disconnected from a, bar a large bunch of people, and a lot of the predictions, expectations, and anticipations were wrong. We also saw this in our own federal election to some degree this year, where it seemed that it was going to be a liberal victory or a coalition victory, and it was just a matter of how much the coalition won. In the end, uh, they obviously did uh, get back into power, but it was quite a shock, I think, for a lot of people how close that election was, and particularly the rise of the kind of minor parties, micro parties, these sorts of things. We're seeing a similar set of events occurring around the world in relation to, let's say, a dissatisfaction and a frustration with elites, uh, establishment order, these sorts of things. So what's the relevance of this, this bit of observation? First of all, this should make us extremely cynical about poll-driven politics. If the polls and the numbers that they're getting seem to be so now, you know, all through this year seems to be so consistently wrong across a bunch of countries, then those processes, the things that they're using to, you know, drive the, the polling, there seems to be some great problem there. I think this also uh, sets us with a really big challenge to focus group driven policy making. If the polls are wrong and the methodologies that they're using to kind of drive politics, if they're the same sets of methodologies that are being used to develop and drive policy, then we've got real problems there as well. 
Um, and this, I think, may be a challenge to, if not an insurmountable one, but a challenge to evidence-led policy making. If the evidence is as like it's based on similar processes to the polls, then the evidence is unreliable, and we need to rethink those things. There is importantly a big challenge to traditional media as well. I think quite um, quite. Interestingly, this past election had, you had the media in the US, a lot of the conservative media as well, getting out in opposition to Trump. You had the media taking really strong positions on the leadership of the, the Republican uh, candidate and saying a whole lot of things about him, how he was unfit to lead in ways that were unprecedented before. A bunch of um, fairly conservative newspapers um, and, and such who previously had either been always pro-Republican or had held off making any statements as to who they would be supporting, came out against Trump. And I think here we see this, part of the problem is we've now got this big shift away from traditional media to you know, your Breitbart, to Twitter, to all of these things. And these are you know, really hard challenges for us to face. Um, my answer to any of these challenges is I have no idea what to do, but the challenges are there. Um, the second point that I wanted to bring up was the divisions within the US. So we've heard it said that this is an, uh, an historic and overwhelming Trump victory. You know, this is absolute certainty of how powerful this kind of anti-elitism sentiment is in the US and we, we should really pay big attention to this and they've got a massive mandate, et cetera, et cetera. However, let's not forget that Clinton won the popular vote, uh, 60,981,000 versus Trump's 60,350,000. Um, this, I think, shows that there are deep, deep divisions within the US. So it's not simply that you know, Trump won and these things, it was extremely close and there's a whole lot of people who are very, very opposed to Trump. And you've seen this in the protests and uh, a lot of the opposition that has now kind of kicked up against Trump, possibly in an even stronger way. One of the problems with the US is it seems, um, the times that I've been there, it seems that the poverty there is endemic. It's really stark how different the, let's say the kind of, the nice parts of the US are really nice, the not nice parts are absolutely terrible. And I think this goes in part to the elites got it wrong because they typically are not in contact with the non-elites. So again, you've got this big division, big distinctions between you know, one set of people in the US and another set of people. And it's interesting, I think, that these divisions uh, did not sit, sit across traditional party lines. Um, and this goes to, in part, what uh, I think Rory and both Matt had said about a crushing of the moderate centre. So you've got this really interesting breakdown or break apart where even though it ended up that the Republicans won, this seemed to be in spite of a whole lot of the Republican elites who were in opposition to Trump. So we've got this really interesting set of internal dynamics going on within the US at the moment. Um, the relevance of this is, if nothing else, let's take Trump at his hat, as we would say. Um, it's going to take a great amount of effort to make America great again. And to make America whole again, that is going to be a huge, huge, very resource intensive task. Um, and I think in parallel to what both Matt and uh, Michael were saying, this need to rebuild America and, you know, let's say, make it whole again, this will use heaps of resources, resources, which is a possible basis for further retraction of US international engagement, TPP, NATO, pivot to Asia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we can see that there might be a whole bunch of internal mechanisms going on that are gonna be even further reason to think that there might be a retraction of US um, involvement externally. The final uh, thing that I wanted to talk about are national security norms. So Clinton claimed today that the FBI director James Comey's actions in releasing information about another tranche of emails was the thing that killed her chances of success. Um, I think the Clinton team said today, and I'm quoting, there are lots of reasons why an election like this is not successful. Our analysis is that the Comey's letter raised doubts and this stopped our momentum. So it's all Comey's fault. Um, obviously, uh, we can criticise the, the um, those claims um, about whether this was actually the thing that turned it or not. But one of the interesting things to notice is that Comey, as FBI director, faced heavy criticism for his actions in releasing you know, this stuff that there were even more emails. Part of the reason why he faced heavy criticism is we often hold or believe that national security uh, professionals and especially leaders of national security should be apolitical. National security is something that's far more important than small, you know, kind of media politics, you know, we, we should be taking this in an apolitical sense. However, one of the things that we need to remember is maybe Comey felt justified, and of course I'm not Comey, so I don't know how he feels, but maybe he felt justified by the unprecedented letter of 50 Republican former national security officials, including former CIA Director Michael Hayden, who called Trump reckless and unfit to lead. So maybe um, 
their actions are what prompted Comey to kind of break this idea of, well, you know, you shouldn't be involved as a national security person in politics. Um, I think there's also an interesting thing that there was a resentment that lower level, lower level government people get punished for mistreatment of confidential information, but higher ups like General Petraeus and Secretary of State Clinton can get away with it. And I think here we can also see some, maybe some frustration about the norms in and around national security. Um, in terms of the relevance, this makes us, I think this should make us think and question uh, whether there is such independence of national security from politics, whether uh, government officials indeed can and should be independent. Um, I think that's a really interesting discussion to have. There are also going to be costs to going public, particularly if you break a norm, then it seems to permit others to break that norm as well. And to draw a very long bow from this, bear in mind that when thinking that Trump had said that he supports use of torture for punishment, and killing the families of terrorists um, and a return to uh, national trade protectionism, etc. This might then justify a whole bunch of people doing bad things to either Americans or Australian interests. So if you're torturing people for, pu uh, for punishment, not to extract information, etc., then maybe that permits them to do horrible things as well. Um, and maybe as a final comment, uh, thinking of this so-called post-truth era, um, where Trump seems to have an exceptionalism where he can say things and then change his position the very next day and claim that he never said it in the first place. I think the interesting thing here is this can also only hold for so long. And we, if we look at Trump's claims to drain the swamp, um, you know, because of a lot of this, getting back to this frustration with elites and establishment, he seems to now be filling it up, uh, filling that swamp back up. He's got uh, some of his advisors uh, were former people who are uh, deeply engaged with Goldman Sachs. He's filling it up with family members and those who agree with him. And I think many of us would agree, OK, there is a need to drain part of the swamp. Uh, but if you're going to replace it with you know, family members and people who are part of the establishment, then it's going to be really hard to see how Trump can maintain the popular support that he uh, worked so hard to develop. Thank you. There's going to be some time now for some comments and questions from members of the group. But I might first go to my colleagues with a, a starter, uh, just to get the conversation going. And I would note that in terms of uh, their expertise, I should have mentioned earlier that uh, whether you realise it or not, uh, Matt Sussex is, is also a Russia specialist, as well as having a, a very strong handle on a range of international security issues. So Matt, I suspect your understanding of how authoritarian systems work is going to be uh, of particular interest, uh, a particular interest in the in the years ahead, but also your understanding of the, the Russia-US relationship. So I might go to you first, if that's all right. Um, I mean, I my own, I guess, take on all of this, you know, which is fairly, fairly weak, I guess, is that there is a, a new unpredictability at work. And I think that um, even if, even if uh, we assume that Trump doesn't actively seek to implement a lot of the promises or positions he's taken on international security. It's that question of competence, in fact, um, that's going to come to the fore. Wh whether you agree with him or not, um, is he going to do a competent, credible, predictable job of managing the daily security crises uh, that will come his way? So I want to maybe start with you about the US-Russia relationship and feel free to touch on China as well. Um, and just offer a few thoughts on how you see these relationships unfolding and could it in fact be that before long, before long Russia realise it, realises that it doesn't like what it has perhaps helped uh, bring about? Yeah, thanks Rory. Um, I think the first uh, thing that Putin will be thinking is let's see if we can uh, test to see how far a US-Russia compact or a Putin-Trump axis might go. Um, we could expect that test probably sometime within the next 140 days. I only say that because it's about 70 days to inauguration, and you would expect it about 70 days uh, within the window, 70 days after. Uh, we can speculate about what form that might take, but I would have thought it would have something to do with Ukraine, um, and uh, if not the Baltic states, uh, just to see how far Trump is prepared to back this view. He has or seems to have developed that uh, NATO uh, is not necessarily uh, wedded or beholden to the Baltic states uh, and that NATO shouldn't be mucking around in Ukraine because that's uh, someone else's backyard. Um, that said, I would have thought that the Chinese would want to do uh, the same too, just to see uh, how far they can push Trump around, if they can push Trump around. And they would both be thinking whether or not it's possible to uh, stab them in the back 
uh, and see how far, uh, how far Trump is prepared uh, to, to wear uh, repeated rebuffs and repeated uh, poor behaviour. That's something that touches Russia more than China, probably. Uh, but uh, certainly elites within uh, the Moscow foreign and security policy community uh, are, are very keen to test, take Trump out for a test drive. Now, if they end up buying uh, the car, it may turn out to be a lemon. Uh, it may turn out to be a lemon because Trump has, as we know, uh, a record on changing his mind repeatedly uh, and uh, deciding that the exact opposite is, uh, is what he wants to do now. It may well be the case that, uh, despite, uh, in spite of an initial warming or rapprochement, uh, Trump will come to foresee or perceive Russia as a potential challenge to the European security order. And there will be plenty of people making that argument in his ear, whether they're from the Baltic states, whether they're from the Visegrad states, whether they're from West European democracies, uh, all of whom will be uh, desperately trying to get access to the new president. Uh, if, in fact, he changes his mind along those lines, uh, he will probably respond in a fairly robust manner, such is the way that he goes about his politics, whether it's on one side or whether it's in favour of another view. So I think there is a possibility that uh, Russians may come to have a bit of buyer's remorse when it comes to, uh, to Trump. However, we will have to wait and see. There would, some who, there would be some who would argue that uh, for a long time the EU, NATO, has been mucking around in Ukraine to very little, ga to, to very little real gain and that perhaps, you know, uh, a satisfied, secure Russia uh, will be more stable and less of an irritant to Western interests if it does have, perceive that it has a stable sphere of influence in the former Soviet space. The one question underlining that, though, is will that be enough for Putin? Um, Michael, do you want to add anything to that, whether from a China point of view or a Russia point of view? Or uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I, on the, the Chinese issue, I mean, I think Matt's right to suggest that the Chinese, very much like Putin, will be willing to take Trump for a test, test drive. Um, the, the additional question, though, I think is in the effects of that dynamic in the region more broadly. So will we see more of the Philippines, for instance, which tend, seems to be bandwagoning with China now? I mean, if Trump makes good on some of these promises, particularly with respect to multilateral trade agreements like TPP, um, which seems pretty, pretty much dead in the water now, um, and also the denigration of, of Obama's pivot in a very broad sense. Um, will a number of regional actors hedge their bets now and say, well, China is willing to provide or seems willing to provide various public goods, perhaps global public goods, Asian Infrastructure and Development Bank, uh, One Belt, One Road investments, etc. cetera. Uh, is this a way to hedge against the decline or withdrawal of American uh, forward posture in, in Asia more broadly? Um, so I think that's probably a very big question, particularly for Australia, to deal with. Mm. Adam, I'll come back to you in a minute on, on um, politics and ethics, but I just wanted to add to those observations on, on great power relations, I guess, before I go to the group, that um, well, two, two points. One is uh, we still don't have a clear picture, I think, on what are, what are the thoughts in a lot of the other great capitals of the world. It's interesting that despite all of the negative things Trump has said and thinks about the alliance with Japan or about Japan, um, that there is a meeting now uh, with uh, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe in New York where I suspect uh, there'll be a lot of reassurances offered and, you know, well, I didn't quite mean it like that, but it would be fascinating to be a fly on the wall in that meeting. Um, the other meeting uh, that I think was very important that didn't get a lot of international attention was that the day after the US election, the Japanese and Indian uh, Prime Ministers met uh, for a pre-scheduled meeting, and you can be sure that there was only one thing uh, in that conversation. And I actually think that there's an interesting dynamic there we need to watch, which is, in fact, that I suspect the Trump presidency will be received with a lot of pragmatism in India. Um, and, you know, don't assume that India is going to share, I think, the automatic, um, the gut reaction, if you like, that a lot of democracies have had uh, to what's happened in the United States. Uh, India's had its own experiences with some pretty volatile politics over the years. And you could say, in fact, in a way, in his electoral style and campaigning, uh, that Modi is sort of halfway between Obama and Trump, in a way, um, a very effective uh, populist campaign, but also informed by a lot of youth and a lot of hope. So um, there's a thesis to be written somewhere on the Obama, Modi, Trump sequence. Um, so I think we should, we should look objectively at a whole range of capitals. But my last question before I go to the audience is about nuclear weapons. 
Um, because in deterrence theory, of course, one view is that if your adversary, in fact, gives you the impression that they're so crazy they might just be willing to use nuclear weapons in response to a provocation, it helps deterrence work. So I'm just wondering if either of you, any of you, because I know that ethics and nukes have something to do with one another as well, um, Adam, I'm wondering if any of you could just chance a view on whether, in fact, this is going to make nuclear deterrence uh, more effective rather than less. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I, I suppose it, the question is, I suppose famously um, Kissinger talked about you know, Nixon's so-called madman theory vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the Vietnam War. Um, you know, is Trump going to be the same? I'm, I'm not so sure. I and mean, his views of nuclear weapons and deterrence, or the nuclear, uh, as he as he phrases it, uh, are fairly fairly limited. Uh, he seems to have taken a back of the cigarette packet view of Kenneth Waltz's arguments. You know, more more nuclear weapons, the better. Uh, nuclear weapons being a stabilising factor in particularly in multipolar regional systems. So this is sort of behind his argument that well, South Korea and Japan should look after their own security by acquiring nuclear weapons. That's all well and good on the surface, but it goes to the heart of this question of. Uh, the institutional uh, order that the United States has underwritten, particularly in our region, uh, since 1945. Uh, in the nuclear context, of course, based on the, the NPT itself, but also a wider, a wider array of alliance relationships vis-a-vis uh, -vis Japan, South Korea, of which extended nuclear deterrence is a, is a core part. So I really, like, my, like many things with Trump, I don't think he's fully thought, thought through the implications of some of what he's discussing. Uh, for instance, uh, will... Would Japan, if it did seek nuclear weapons, what is the response of China? Are most likely going to be to this scenario. If you're introducing this particular uh, variable into an already tense set of dynamics, particularly in Northeast Asia, it seems to be a recipe for disaster, I would think. Thanks, Michael. Uh, I'd just add one observation that, uh, that although deterrence theory would, classic deterrence theory would say, yes, a nutcase uh, reinforces deterrence, there is another aspect to this, and Trump has said, quite clearly that he wants to pursue, uh, with much greater haste, uh, United, United States missile defence systems. Now, the thing about missile defence is that it fundamentally under, undermines deterrence, because in the views of those who are observing, uh, who don't have a missile defence system, uh, it means that the United States would have a uh, penetrable shield from which it could, in, it could strike with impunity. What does that prompt? Well, it prompts other states to build more and more nuclear weapons because they need more to get through any shield, or at least that is their threat, that they will still have a survivable nuclear deterrent and a functional nuclear deterrent that can get through any type of, of shield. So uh, that needs to be taken into consideration as well, the extent to which missile defences either promote or undermine the deterrence risk or the deterrence benefits of Trump in the White House with his own peculiar views on uh, the utility of nuclear weapons. Adam. So I'll just say something quite briefly. Deterrence isn't my area, um, as most of these things aren't. But um, as I understand deterrence theory, part of it is you know, it's based on rational actors and acting rationally in their self-interest. Part of the crazy brave idea is, yeah, I'm so crazy I might just use it. That only works if people think that you will actually use it and you'll use it, let's say, in defence of your own uh, area. If he's so crazy that he won't intervene in other areas, it could then... Uh, possibly lead to um, countries saying, well, you know, the US isn't going to become engaged in this, we can now use nukes against other countries and the US will remain unengaged in that sense. So maybe that's a counterpoint to this kind of crazy, crazy brave or, you know, in madman theory um, that this will actually run counter to uh, reducing the risk of nuclear. Um, yeah. Thanks. Just a thought. I mean, I think it's a case of working out, you know, in a very objective way, what are the impacts on deterrence in the world? And I think at the moment, um, you know, the, the destabilisation theory is, is paramount, but I do think we need to look at uh, both sides of it. But let's open it up to others in the group now. If you have a question, please get my attention and um, let, let us know who you are. Uh, and just remember, we're being recorded. Uh, please, sir. Terry Henderson. <coughs> Excuse me. Terry Henderson. I'm a member of the public. I'm American, but I've lived in Australia for 40 years. And nothing in the Trump campaign is unfamiliar, as I think you've heard from the Jacksonian tradition. One thing, and, and I would point out that most of the people in the last week are the same people who were talking about the polls two weeks ago, and um, probably with about the same degree of expertise. Now, one, one thing that seems to be assumed is that uh, Trump will control things because he's got the Congress. 
that uh, both the Senate and the House will lie on their backs and say, scratch my belly. But the, the composition is pretty much virtually the same as the composition during the term that's just ending. And it's quite possible, particularly on some national security issues, that he may have a lot of trouble with his own party, probably more than with the Democrats. I just wanted to raise that possibility. Yeah, look, that's an excellent observation. I don't know if any of our panelists want to respond briefly. Uh, sure. I mean, I, I think I, I agree very much with, with that observation. I mean, even in terms of domestic politics, it's pretty clear that the divisions within the Republican Party are perhaps wider than even between Trump and some, some Democrats. I mean, a lot of what was behind, I mean, Adam touched on this, some of the conservative media outlets and their repudiation of Trump uh, was the argument that, well, he's actually not a real conservative. Um, as opposed to, say, some of the Tea Party types uh, in, in the House. So that raises that issue in terms of domestic politics. But in terms of foreign policy, um, I think the Iran deal will be interesting as to how Trump approaches that. I mean, obviously, there's been a, a pretty strong segment of the right of the Republican Party that has been against this uh, from the very beginning. And a lot of this is based on uh, the view that the United States has to protect Israel. Um, I think this is sort of to the elephant in the room, if you will, in respect to the Iran deal. Now, where does Trump fall on, on, on that sort of spectrum of argument, I think, is unclear, um, given that he flips and flops as his whim takes it, it seems. So uh, I think your, your assessment is accurate. Um, one of the things that did actually surprise me, I think it was at, um, when Trump was confirmed as the, the Republican candidate, a lot of things he was saying there in terms of economics and economic theory was absolutely counter to the prevailing orthodoxy within the Republican camp. You know, this kind of uh, reduction of laissez-faire, you know, free trade, all of these things, and he was very, very opposed to a lot of the things that seem to be absolute core Republican beliefs. So in that sense, I think he's going to find it really, really hard to get some of those things through, um, which of course goes to this thing of, uh, you know, it's easy to be popular when you're a populist, but then when you actually have to make it happen and none of this stuff comes through and, you know, the, the rust belt still remains rusty, then you're going to have a lot of trouble. The counterpoint to that is there's going to be a bunch of things I think that he'll be able to get through quite easily, having, you know, being president, having the Congress and the House. Um, so one of the examples that I was hearing a few days ago was um, with the... Uh, bring in a new uh, Supreme Court justice and bring in, making sure it's a conservative Supreme, Supreme Court justice, there's quite a strong worry or feeling that Roe v Wade is going to be reversed. Roe v Wade being the big um, uh, precedent that allowed women a right to have an abortion in the US. So that, I think, is going to be one of the things that he will find it very easy to get through. He himself has said that he's going to be trying to push that um, reversal of Roe v Wade. So in some sense, some things are going to be really, really hard for him to get through. Other things are going to be quite easy, I think, and that's you know part of the concern that a lot of people had. You know, say the 60 million plus who did vote for Hillary. Um, I'll I'll just very quickly add that I completely agree that uh, the House and the Republicans may well be a break on excess in a trumpet on a Trump administration. The only caveat there is that there is a different test in terms of excess. Uh, that we need to apply now. That doesn't necessarily uh, reflect what it did just a few days ago. Thank you. We'll take another question or comment from the room, please, over here. Oh, yes. Just wait for the microphone, please. Yes, and introduce yourself. Yeah, uh, yeah Liz Bolton from the uh, Fenner School. I was just wondering if you had any comments about how this might impact the United Nations and if, if there's any opportunity that the rest of the world might suddenly feel a sense of fear and mobilise together and just leave the... US to do their thing, and there might be some really strong alliances. Um, you know, and particularly, you know, look at things like climate change, a lot of other mutual interests that other nations have, that there might be a nice stabilizing force that comes back um, that way. Well, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I think that's, that is a possibility. I'm not sure if it is likely, though, um, given the deep divisions within UN in various levels whether it be in the human rights agenda, R2P, for instance, or even on climate change. But the climate change issue, for instance, you have to deal with the divide between the developed West and particularly China and India. Um, I think that's the, the biggest roadblock there. So the key issue with uh, the Trump administration, you would suspect would repudiate any deals Obama administration has made on this front. But the question then becomes who will take the lead uh, for international climate change endeavours uh, if the United States does not. And I think that's the, 
the, the biggest the biggest question because clearly Trump will not. I think, um, I mean, that's, it's nice to be optimistic in these scenarios and think, OK, maybe some, you know, some really interesting things that we don't expect will come about. Obviously, so many people's predictions so far have been terrible, so, you know, expect the unexpected. Um, one of the reasons, I guess, for pessimism or not thinking that, you know, the, uh, say, for instance, climate change will be resolved in this regard is there does seem to be a whole bunch of uh, supporting reasons to think we'll go to this multipolar kind of regional hegemony, all these sorts of things, and climate change is obviously a global problem and needs global coordination. And if we do have this kind of breakdown into regional um, areas, I think that that's, you know, a, a possible way of preventing any collective, you know, globally uh, collective action on climate change. So if the regional stuff holds, uh, you know, increased regionalism holds, then I think things like climate change are probably far less likely, or coordinated action on climate change, I should say, are far less likely to occur. I think just I would add two points to that. One is that um, on some issues, I think climate change is a classic example. I think there will be some, you know, fairly opportunistic stepping up, including by China in a leadership role. Uh, and it's, you know, it's pretty interesting that we've reached the point where China now portrays itself as the world leader in um, mitigating climate change. Um, but on other issues, if you look at the issues that the UN Security Council deals with, or if you look at the security issues that the UN deals with, I think I agree with Matt's point about the future of the, um, uh, the responsibility to protect. Um, I also would say that uh, if the US takes a very different view on human rights internationally or on its activism on human rights, who is going to pick up that torch? Uh, who with any you know, uh, resources is going to pick up that torch? And I'd also just leave you with uh, an interesting thought about who would be the five leaders of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council if the far right wins the election in France uh, and we end up with um, really, uh, you know, you, you can list the five leaders in your own mind and work out who is the, you know, who, who you would put the most faith in among those five leaders of the US, China, Russia, Britain and France uh, a year from now uh, and think about the limits that's going to put on the United Nations, especially in a security sense. Uh, so I think, I think there is space for new creative coalitions, but I think there's going to be some limits too. Um, young man here had a question, I think. Hi, my name's Roman Madaus, and I'm a graduate of the uh, Strategic Studies Program at SDSC. So Trump's victory is clearly part of a broader populist wave sweeping across the West, and my question has to do with how this might apply to Australia. So in pretty much every Western European country in the United States, populists are, have taken over or there's a threat of that happening. It hasn't happened in Australia, Canada, and New Zealand. And I was trying to figure out why this might be, because that could be a clue as to, well, whether it's going to come here next or whether there's some sort of recipe for avoiding this. And I found that these three countries have seen a smaller increase than the US and in Western Europe of the relative proportion of foreign-born population. Uh, in Europe, it's been almost a doubling in a lot of areas over the past few decades. The US, 65%. Australia was, I think, 40% or 35%, uh, same with New Zealand, Canada only 25%. Have you examined those figures at all? I mean, I know it's really new that this is, people are trying to explain this, but it is odd that there are three countries in the West that seem to have largely emerged unscathed so far. Have you, do you have your own judgment you can share with us? Or it's a I, fascinating set of questions. I don't know, I don't know Australian politics enough to pr predict whether Pauline Hansen has anything really. Okay, I think, I think there. everyone in the room is going to have their own answer to those questions, and I don't think our panellists have a special expertise, but I might be wrong, but I would like to give them the opportunity, because I think there's some really interesting points there. Please. Uh, yeah, that's fascinating. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't buy it myself. Uh, I would go down the economic path uh, and in, uh, talk about the extent to which Canada, New Zealand and Australia were particularly isolated from the worst effects of the global financial crisis that Australia has not found that hollowing out of its industrial middle uh, that the United States has experienced. Uh, generally speaking, those who work in industry, manufacturing, there have been job losses, but I don't think it's been quite as acute. If we were to play the sort of foreign-born cultural card, there's, unfortunately, the empirical record just dances around so much. I'll give you another uh, one good example. Samuel Huntington, before he died, uh, wrote a book uh, that effectively said that uh, the United States is becoming Latin American, yeah? uh, that uh, it's going to be 60% majority, uh, will speak Spanish, 
and that is going to fundamentally affect its foreign and security policy choices and its domestic policy choices. So I'd be cautious in using that kind of data, particularly since we've got a fairly narrow time slice, uh, to say this is wholesale uh, the reason why. I mean, that'd be an interesting argument to make. I think predominantly, though, the economic argument trumps it. Um, oh, God, I've done it again. <laughs> I've done it again. Beats it. Uh, for the moment, but it's not to say that there, there might not be something in it that would be worth, uh, worth having a look at. So, I think that's on. Yeah, um, two comments that I'd say on that is we have been witnessing um, a rise in populism in Australia, obviously One Nation as the example. And again, you know, as I said earlier, the previous uh, Australian federal election caught a lot of people by surprise by how close it was in the end. Um, I myself was actually predicting a hung parliament um, and it came you know, very, very close to that. So I think that we are experiencing some, some degree of that. I agree with Matt that the economic argument is probably the most powerful explanation why we don't have the, you know, the, the impact or we didn't face the impact of the GFC like other countries. And again, if you travel around the US, you notice the massive disparity between the nice areas and the not nice areas. In Australia, we've got not, not nice areas and some which are very kind of uh, underdeveloped, but in my experience driving around the US, if you once you would get out of the kind of the city centres, things like there was like every third house seemed to be abandoned. And it was really noticeable how deep the poverty was in the areas that weren't rich, basically. Um, we don't have that here in Australia at the moment, but I think it was uh, Paul Keating said a couple of days ago, we are possibly heading in that direction if you look at the problem of housing affordability as one example. You know, we have reasonably good social structures and safety nets and things at the moment. If we start cutting them back or further uh, rolling them back, coupling that with you know, the inability of a whole generation or maybe even a couple of generations now to buy a house or have a house that's you know, you know, half decent, um, maybe we are heading in that direction. So I think you know, at the risk of sounding like the uh, social egalitarian that I am, <laughs> if we want to, like, maybe, maybe Trump will, will actually make America great again. Like, let's, let's say for the sake of argument he can do that and maybe we ought to follow his lead. If it turns out that he can't actually pull off any of the things that he's saying, and we want to prevent a similar thing happening in Australia, then I think that we need to do a lot more to reduce the income inequality, social inequalities that we have in Australia to prevent this sort of populism taking root as deep as it has in the US. You're right, I might um, just jump in with one observation. Um, and I would, I would also mention compulsory voting as being an advantage in this country to guard against, to, to guard against, uh, I guess, the rise of populism. I recall uh, as a diplomat working on election monitoring in Kashmir, of all places, with American and European diplomats. And at the end of the day of you know some very interesting election monitoring, um, I was lamenting the fact that only the voter turnout was only 54%. Um, they, of course, were marvelling at what a high voter turnout it was and how much higher it was than in their countries. So, in fact, um, I would say that compulsory voting, um, you know, we, we should cherish that as something that actually has an enormous moderating impact in Australia, but we can't just rely on that. Uh, and so I think, I think the risk of things changing quite dramatically is something that should consume our political class now, because the role of social media and the role of new forms of mobilisation is something that we haven't yet, haven't yet measured. And, you know, some of that disparity and resentment and so forth that we're seeing in America is, is present in Australia, rightly or wrongly. So, OK, uh, we can take maybe a couple more questions. The gentleman here and I think over here, please. Thank you. My name is Paul Meyer. I'm frequently here at Crawford School and, and enjoy very much these um, presentations. Um, the, a lot was said about the, um, our alliances with the United States and our arrangements there. One thing that hasn't been covered is, to some degree, the, the United States, I think, relies on Australia too, for example, Pine Gap and Northwest Cape. Is there any evidence that that's going to change? Okay. that's a why don't we take, and I'm not evading your answer because it's an important question, but let's take the other question. So we've got a sort of a menu of options for colleagues and then I'll certainly have an answer for that one for you. So and there's a question over here, yeah, please. We can probably take one more after that. We have a, a sort of a smorgasbord of three questions for the panel. My, my uh, Anchor Broderson, formerly a defence, just enjoying a break at the moment. Uh, Enjoy. <laughs> The, uh, my question is very, very similar, actually. I was curious to hear a bit more about your views on what the uh, relationship, alliance relationship between Australia and the US may be uh, like over the next six to 12 months. 
and uh, particularly same view, it's not just Pine Gap, there are a range of facilities that are actually really important to the US that um, gives us a bit more influence than some people think. Fair enough. We'll take one more, I think. Um, we, actually, I'll, I'll, take, I'll be really brave and take two more and we'll try and trust the panel to remember the questions. So I think there's a gentleman at the back and there's a woman here at the front. Uh, so. How long will it take before, oh, Peter Ellis, uh, how long will it take, do you think, before he utters those words, you're fired, and okay. has a problem recruiting anyone else? Okay, all right, good one. Actually, there's a gentleman, I think, towards the back there that had his hand up earlier, and then we'll come down to you, madam, and we're done. Uh, here we go. I'm trusting you guys to pick and choose. Hi, um, my name is uh, Jisoo Elk in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Yes. I work in the nuclear policy section, and we are busy so getting allowance for the, uh, the 2020 MPT review cycle. I know there were some earlier discussions on nuclear weapons and the MPT. Just interested in your views on the sort of medium and long-term prognosis for the MPT as one of the importance of rules-based systems for international security uh, in light of the, uh, the Trump presidency. Thanks very much. Thank you. And then I think final question down the front. Hi, I'm Jan Goldswood, an alumni of the Crawford School. Um, I'm interested in follow-up from Liz's um, issue about um, climate change security around the world. And I was interested to know that Richard Branson wrote in the Australian Business or Business um, publication that perhaps if governments aren't going to do something, um, companies, in, in, industry and business could take on that initiative. And whether you in your research and from a security point of view, could see whether there's a role for Australian business in leading the way and perhaps influencing Trump and other places in renewables. Thank you. So we've got a very uh, rich menu of uh, questions and comments there. I'm going to give each of the panellists maybe two or three minutes to answer the key points they wish to address, and then I'll try and wrap up. So, Matt, can we start with you? Yeah, yeah uh, look, on the Australian facilities uh, or joint facilities, uh, yeah, look, uh, there's been some commentary saying that, or oh, now is the time for Australia to fundamentally uh, re-examine its relationship with the United States, whether or not it wants to have one or not. Um, it's interesting that uh, there was a, a poll conducted by the Lowy Institute uh, a few months ago that said, you know, should we distance ourselves from America in the event that Trump wins? And something like 45% said yes. Um, does that necessarily we mean we do so now? No, absolutely not. Um, one, for one thing, we just really do not know which way Trump will jump, and we need an enormous amount of information before we can make that kind of judgment. Second thing is that Australian and US uh, security cooperation in the defence sphere is hardwired into our DNA, that uh, it's something that we do by, a by matter of uh, course. It's also the fact that our military systems are highly interoperable. Uh, that gives us some degree of leverage over Washington. I don't think it gives us the same degree of leverage that we did when Obama was in the White House, but I think it does give us some degree of leverage. It also does mean, of course, that for Australia, in terms of its strategic policy choices, um, it's not a case of, no, it's not an option yet for Australia to simply abandon the US alliance. It means that ultimately it is tied to the fortunes of the United States and also tied to an extent to the preferences of a Trump administration. Uh, I think what Australia's security policy elites fear very much is the type of nightmare scenario that uh, was asked once of Alexander Downer uh, in 2004, some of you may remember this, that he was asked, uh, what would Australia do in the event of a war between the United States and China over Taiwan? And Downer said the first thing that came into his head, which also seemed to be the most logical and sensible thing, and that was Australia would be neutral under uh, that uh, under that uh, situation. Uh, within 24 hours, Richard Armitage, the uh, Se Deputy Secretary of State, had come out and said that he expected Australians would fight and die in order uh, to, uh, to maintain their commitments to the ANZUS Alliance, whereupon Alexander Downer said, yes, of course, that's what we would do. So, so uh, the, fact that, the fact that we do have such deep ties with the United States is very, very difficult to unravel an alliance, unless, of course, the, uh, the country initiating it collapses altogether, and one very much, much hopes that doesn't happen with the United States. Uh, okay, on the issue of uh, nuclear, nuclear proliferation and uh, what a Trump presidency might mean, um, I think a core issue here is 
to ask whether President Trump or any of his key cabinet level positions, whoever will be Secretary of State, Secretary of Defence, etc., do they actually believe in the central bargain behind the non-proliferation regime and the NPT itself, vis-a-vis um, -vis, uh, the nuclear weapon states and non-weapon states? Central to this has been, I would argue, and, and William Walker at St Andrews argues this, uh, he defines it as a logic of deterrence and a logic of restraint and reassurance. Uh, so under this uh, uh, sort of a set of arrangements under the NPT, the weapon states, i.e. the five permanent members of the Security Council, uh, guarantee the non-weapon states that they wouldn't seek to proliferate to any allies, they would give negative security assurances to other states, etc. Um, does Trump believe any of this? And I would suggest that he doesn't, given some of his statements vis-a-vis -vis alliance relationships, for instance. All of, all of these statements vis-a-vis -vis alliances question, A, uh, the economic benefits for the United States to provide security to, say, Japan or South Korea. Um, there's also wider issues to do with the pursuit of ballistic missile defence. And Matt touched upon this as well in the arms racing dynamic that this may, may well unleash, particularly in our region. Uh, if you look at the modernisation of China's nuclear arsenal, for instance, and India's, and also, of course, the, the other issue is, is the US-Russia nuclear relationship. So I think there's a lot to be worried about in, on the, in the nuclear realm vis-a-vis -vis Trump, because I don't think he understands or even believes um, the centrality of that bargain. So I'm going to uh, answer the, or go to the question about him saying you're fired. Um, this, this is really interesting. So I think um, looking at his character as far as we can, you know, obviously in part he's a celebrity creation that doesn't actually match the reality of what he is, but we don't actually know what the reality is. But I, I think there's, I can't remember who it was, but someone from the US Study Centre has uh, proposed this idea that what Trump will frequently do is punish allies who don't support him. So as much, if not more so, than going out against his enemies, he will punish these supporters of him, punish his allies, and particularly this will be the case, I th like if this kind of idea holds, this will be the case where if people don't give him the answers that he wants, he'll fire them, and in this sense, you know, he'll, he'll speak down to them and treat them, treat them quite poorly, which doesn't bode well in part for the people who would then remain around him because it would be a whole bunch of yes men or yes people. Similarly, like I was uh, touching on before, this claim of draining the swamp and getting rid of kind of political corruption and these things, to my mind, if you end up with a bunch of people, irrespective of what your ideologies are, but if you end up with a bunch of people around you who are just kind of yes people, supporters, and will do whatever you say without hesitation, without uh, reflection, that probably leads very quickly to a corrupt government. And going back to this notion of draining the swamp and the frustration that a lot of Americans feel, um, this might then bite him very heavily on the backside. Um, the other idea that uh, was actually Michael Clark mentioned to me a couple of months ago, which seemed absurd, but uh, again, you know, we're all kind of, it is, yeah, it's a, it's a day of unexpectedness at least. This idea that he's actually going to quit or possibly rage quit. Um, so this when Michael first mentioned it to me, I thought, this is just mental. Why would such a thing happen? But think of it this way. He's got a bit of a history of doing, thing, doing these sorts of things where he will set up businesses, he will set up companies, he will set up developments. As soon as he kind of gets them and it gets quite hard, then he'll step away from them and step away from them quite quickly. As far as I can tell, being the US president is a bloody hard job. You look at how much Obama, for example, has aged in the past eight years. Let's not forget Trump is now the oldest president in US history. Uh, the second oldest candidate was, of course, Hillary, um, which speaks something quite interesting about generational change. But um, Trump being the oldest uh, president in history, um, with this uh, history himself of stepping away from things when things get hard and draining, I'm sure his doctor is accurate when he said he's tremendous in his health, but I think that we can actually think... Yeah, healthiest president ever. Um, but I think there is this... There is a likelihood of this that he will kind of be in here and it will be really hard, obviously, to maintain the promises that he's kept and it's a really, really hard job. So there is the possibility of, uh, rather than him saying, you're fired, him saying, I quit. So, you know, <laughs> keep that in mind. So, look, before we wrap up, and I know that I think your question on business and climate change wasn't uh, addressed, but I might just offer a few final thoughts uh, before we wrap up. And I think just be aware that um, I think with the diversity of views here among my colleagues and um, we have a pretty 
pretty healthy set of debates among ourselves. Matt will have to argue missile defence one of these days because I uh, have a different take. But uh, that's the beauty of, um, of, of academia is that, um, is that there is a lot of wealth of insight and knowledge here at the National Security College. So I hate to say it, but there's probably been uh, no better time to actually study some of the things that my colleagues teach. Uh, and, and we do have some booklets outside and my colleague Farnaz is here who can talk a bit more about that, but that's just that's all I'll go on the hard sell. Um, on the serious issues of substance, I would just say that firstly, um, not only on the issue you speak about, uh, Madam, regarding climate change and business, but more generally, we're clearly going to have to find a whole new set of points of traction as a country, as a partner into the United States, uh, rather than simply assuming that our relationship with the White House and the new policy making leadership of the United States will be the best way to preserve Australia's interests. I think that is a whole of nation effort. Um, on the other point uh, regarding the, the alliance, the intelligence relationship and so forth, I think I'll just conclude on this note, which is that Australia does bring a lot to the table uh, in the alliance. It's not simply about uh, the, uh, you know, the relatively small but very courageous contributions Australia has made to US-led military expeditions and uh, operations overseas in the past. It's also about the role Australia plays in helping maintain, apart from anything else, a reliable picture of what's happening in the world, intelligence and maritime surveillance and so forth, uh, in the Indo-Pacific, in Asia, which continues to be the global centre of gravity economically and strategically, despite what we're seeing happening on uh, the other side of the Pacific. And of course, the United States is uh, a key part of this, uh, of this great region. So I would say that um, we probably need to work harder to make it very clear to our ally how important those capabilities are and what a burden Australia already carries in that space. And I do think that will help Australia to shape uh, the alliance through some difficult years, uh, years ahead. Uh, and, of course, it goes without saying that without the alliance, Australia would be a very different power in terms of its defence and its intelligence capabilities. And I suspect we'd all be paying much, much higher taxes apart from anything else uh, or making decisions about Australia's vulnerability in a very uncertain world. So, look, on that, on that cheery note, I will um, ask you to join me in thanking my colleagues and we'll see you again. Thank you. <laughs>